Hi, students. Welcome to video 25 on climate change. <clears throat> so <clears throat> what is climate change? What exactly do we mean by that? Um, so we're basically talking about variations in Earth's climate. Um, so remember, climate is a long-term thing. It is kind of like the average weather along maybe 30 to 40 years, whereas weather is kind of a very short-term what's happening outside. Um, so when we say climate change, we're saying that things have been changing dealing with the Earth's climate for over a 30 year period. Um, remember, we don't really say global warming anymore because that implies that the entire earth is getting hotter all the time. And that's really not the case. There are some places that are getting cooler during certain parts of the year. Um, so we say climate change because that takes into account regional changes. So here's a chart of the greenhouse effect. We talked about this a little bit in class already. I wanna focus your attention into this part where we're talking about the outgoing um, radiation that is happening. Um, so <clears throat> we have, you know, some stuff that's leaving Earth, some energy leaving Earth. We can actually change how much is being emitted. So how do we do that? Um, these are your um, greenhouse gases that we can put into the atmosphere that changes the amount of energy that leaves Earth. Um, we need to also look at what is their potential for global warming. So we call that global warming potential GWP. And that is the ability of one molecule to contribute to warming, and we do it in relation to carbon dioxide. So we say carbon dioxide has a uh, global warming potential of one, and then everything else is in relation to that. So um, methane, for example, is 30 times more potent than carbon dioxide, going all the way to CFCs, which are 20,000 times uh, worse than carbon dioxide. Um, you'll notice that water vapor is so small in terms of the global warming potential that we don't really worry about it too much. So why do we talk about carbon dioxide so much then if it's not very potent? Uh, the reason is because it's extremely abundant. It is the most abundant greenhouse gas that is in our atmosphere. It has gone from 280 parts per million to about 411 in the past 150 years. Um, and we have not seen any of these kinds of measurements over the last 800,000 years. Uh, the highest we got before previous uh, or today's records, about 300 parts per million. Um, so this is a huge change for our atmosphere and we're seeing some impacts because of that. So where is this carbon dioxide coming from? Mostly from burning fossil fuels. Um, this is carbon that was stored in the lithosphere for a very, very long time, and it would have stayed there for a very long time, uh, except that we're pulling the fossil fuels up and we're burning them. Um, deforestation is also causing us to have less carbon sinks, less places to store that carbon. Um, and trees can actually pull out more carbon than they release, same thing as oceans, but they're not able to pull out enough in order to take up what we're actually putting into the atmosphere. So that's really the kind of big deal. Um, so where are some of these greenhouse gases coming from? Mostly from transportation, which is using oil, also electricity, which is using coal, and then industry, which is using coal, oil, and natural gas. Um, so those three sectors are really where we're putting most of our greenhouse gases in the atmosphere from. So some things can also actually cause cooling, though, that we need to think about. Um, so aerosols are like little bitty tiny particles, you know, kind of like dust and things like that that gets into the atmosphere. These things can reflect the sun's rays, so they increase the albedo of the Earth. Um, and you'll notice that, for example, when a volcano erupts, um, this actually, the albedo will increase and it will reflect more light um, and send it away. So volcanoes actually cause slight like, cooling effects. Um, at least for a little while. Um, same thing with sulfate aerosols that might come from burning coal. Um, however, these are very short-term things that do not outweigh um, the other warming potentials. So something else we need to understand um, if we want to make sure that we understand whether or not the warming is human-caused. Uh, Milankovitch cycles happen um, there's three different cycles and they happen different time periods and we need to make sure that this is not the reason why there's uh, an increase in temperature. Um, so sometimes we change the wobble of the earth, sometimes we change the tilt, sometimes we actually change the shape of the orbit a little bit. Um, so the wobble, if you can imagine that the earth is like a dreidel or a spin top, um, that wobble 
you know, will actually change about every 200,000 or 20,000 years. Um, the tilt can change. Right now we're at 23 and a half. Sometimes we're at 25. Sometimes we're at 22. Um, so that will change periodically about every 40,000 years. And then the actual orbit of the Earth can also change. It can become a more exaggerated ellipse or we can become a little bit more circular. And that happens about every 100,000 years. Um, now, I don't really like this diagram because it makes you think that you know, we're way exaggerated of an ellipse. Um, this is actually what's in the textbook and it's not quite like that. Um, but it's still a good diagram to show you the difference in the changes. So other things that can cause warming um, besides human activities. So the sun can become um, more active or less so we can have more solar flares. Um, this chart actually shows you though that over the past like 100 years, We've had pretty constant or even decreasing amounts of solar activity while we've still been having an increase in temperature. So we know that it can't be the sun. Uh, we also can look at the ocean. The ocean can hold a lot more carbon dioxide than the atmosphere can. Um, and then warm ocean water is going to actually be able to absorb less carbon dioxide, which leads to a positive feedback because now your carbon dioxide ends up staying more into the atmosphere, which is then going to cause more warming. And then the uh, atmosphere is warmer, the water is going to get warmer, and it can absorb even less. Um, so we need to look at El Nino also to make sure that it's not increasing in temperature because there's an El Nino event. Um, so El Nino does cause an increase in temperature because you have less trade winds. Um, there's there are um, weaker trade winds. And so this energy and the heat moves out across the entire Pacific. So South and North America would have hotter conditions during an El Nino. We need to make, need to make sure that that's not what's happening when we're looking at climate change. We also need to look at ocean circulation. Um, so oceans can circulate energy all around the globe. You have your warm, fresh surface water currents, and then you have your cold, salty water currents. So the cold, salty water is more dense. That's why it's on the bottom. And this density difference is what continues to make this cycle move. Um, so one thing that we're looking at is if the Greenland ice melts, um, that fresh water ends up diluting this, the ocean water, which causes that distance density difference to stop moving. Um, and if that's the case, which we do currently see a little bit of slowing, um, we could potentially stop this whole system, which would mean that the energy from the equator would not be making it up to places like Europe. Um, and that would actually throw Europe into a huge ice age and would basically make it a uh, ice sheet. So um, how do we know about the past climates? Uh, we can use proxy indicators. Nobody was there 100,000 years ago to tell us what the temperature was, um, but we can use things like ice cores um, that have built up over hundreds of thousands of years, and that substitutes for our direct measurements. So for example, the ice cores have bubbles in them, and we can look back and we can see what was the at atmosphere composition, uh, what was the greenhouse gas composition, what was the temperature like, how much snow actually fell by looking at the thickness of the um, ice sheet during those years, how much fire was there, um, because we can look at like kind of like the ash that we might see in the ice itself. Um, and that can tell us a lot about what the climate was like back then. Um, but not all proxy indicators are going to be good because some of them have a very specific time. So for example, tree rings, we can use them up to a certain point, but then after a while, we're just not going to have trees that are old enough to go back you know, billions of years, um, whereas our rocks can actually go back billions of years um, to look into different things. Um, so we put all this information together and we put it in computers and let them shoot out information for us. Um, this will take a ton of time for humans to make, so computers are a lot better at doing these kinds of calculations. So if we only look at natural factors, um, our model is the blue and our actual observations are the red. Um, so the computer shows us that the natural factors would not be accounting for this increase in temperature that we're seeing over the past 150 years. Um, if we look at anthropogenic sources, it's a little bit more in line. And then if we look at both compounded, it's almost you know, identical. It's pretty accurate. Um, so what this model is telling us is that it is both natural, uh, but mainly anthropogenic factors that are increasing the temperature because natural by themselves would not be showing um, the difference here that we would need to see. So these models can also predict the future in a way. We can see kind of what trends are going out into the next, you know, 100 years or so to see what the temperatures might be on the planet. 
So what do we do with this data? Um, we can actually make predictions. We can help governments plan solutions and things like that. Um, so we have a panel, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It was established in 1988. It's basically a huge group of scientists and government officials. And they came together and started kind of reviewing this data and saying, here's what the data is telling us. So they've had five assessments. Um, the last one came out in 2014, and they basically said, uh, yes, it is definitely warming. There's absolutely, you know, that's definitely happening. Um, we haven't been able to stop it. And it is extremely likely about 95 to 100% probability that human factors have been contributing, the dominant factor contributing to this warming over the last 100 years. Um, they're working on a sixth assessment right now to kind of give us more updated information, uh, but they come out with one about every five to 10 years. What else did they say are some of the impacts that we're seeing or we could see? Um, so things like ice caps and glaciers melting, which can increase sea level and also cause loss of habitat. So I feel like the polar bear up there is kind of the picture that we always see when, in regards to global warming. Uh, we also are seeing stronger storms, more hurricanes, uh, more frequent heat waves and droughts while also having more flooding in some places. Um, now with sea level rise, you're destroying a lot of habitats, but you're also actually adding habitat. Um, you're making things um, coastal areas that used not to be coastal areas. So in a way, that might be a good thing. Um, and then we know that <clears throat> our biomes are determined by temperature and precipitation. So if you're changing those things, you're changing the soil, you're changing the biomes across the planet. So what can we do? Um, there are two kind of approaches that people take. Um, one is mitigation, trying to do actions that will reduce emissions that cause the, the climate change in the first place. Um, and then there's also adaptation. So we know that the climate is changing. It's going to change no matter what, at least a certain amount. Um, we can stop it a little bit, but we still have to adapt to the changes that are inevitable. Um, so the best way to do this is to have you know, kind of be in the middle. So do things that are doing mitigation while at the same time also adaptations. Um, so example, um, you might be looking at local food. So you can you know, do organic farming, which is going to mitigate the climate change, reduce emissions, um, while at the same time it's going to give you things that are adapting to a changing climate. Um, you can also personally try to reduce your carbon footprint, which is the amount of carbon that you're producing. Um, here's the main two things. Areas of concern will be transportation and buying things, um, kind of applicable to this time of year. Uh, some other personal changes. Uh, if you really want to have a huge impact, um, you actually can have one fewer child than you were planning. So if you wanted to have three, maybe you only have two. Uh, but a lot of people are not willing to make that sort of sacrifice, which is understandable. Um, so some simple things is you can eat a plant-based diet, um, you can switch to an electric car, you can buy clean, green energy, um, you can drive or, or ride your bicycle to work or uh, to school. All of these things are small things that if everybody does them can have a big impact. All right, that's it. Bring your questions tomorrow.